Kim is um, a university endowed chair at Texas State University in the School of Criminal Justice. Uh, he is on the Investigative Operations Committee of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. He has a PhD from the School of Criminology at Simon Fraser University. He was a detective inspector uh, with Vancouver City Police and uh, has uh, had a lot to do with a number of um, contentious issues over the years uh, in, in Vancouver and has uh, contributed a great deal uh, to this city um, uh, and globally in the kind of work that he's done. Kim. Okay. Thank you, Neil, and good afternoon. Now, we've heard about wrongful convictions this morning, but I want to focus on investigative failures, which is a little broader concept. It includes, of course, the worst type of investigative failure, which is a wrongful conviction. It also includes unsolved crimes and neglected crimes. You're going to hear about uh, one of the worst neglected crimes in Canadian history from Chief Doug Lepard following me. Um, so I'll let him focus on that. Uh, just a piece of trivia in terms of unsolved crimes. Uh, in the United States, on average, every day, 16 murders occur that will never be solved. When I first became interested in the subject, it occurred to me that a lot of the same mistakes that lead to wrongful convictions also lead to crimes not being solved when they could have been solved. My focus uh, during this presentation is going to be primarily on thinking errors in the investigative process, then also in the meaning of evidence. And the uh, three presentations this morning did a great job of setting up the types of topics that I'll be uh, discussing. Now, it's important to realize that a criminal investigation has two stages. The first is considered evidence-based, where information, data, uh, evidence is collected by investigators. The second stage is suspect-based, where you're now trying to put a case together for a conviction of an individual you've identified as being responsible for the crime. Hopefully correctly, but not always. Another bit of trivia, or sorry, another bit of uh, um, just groundwork I want to lay is the fact that investigators have three tasks. First is to collect the data and evidence. Second is to analyze it. And the third is to think about it. And sometimes that third stage is forgotten about, where everything is seen as a holistic whole and it is what the meaning of the evidence and the meaning of the patterns of the evidence are not necessarily given the consideration they should deserve. Now, we talk about evidence. Klocker and Mastrowski has argued there's only three types of evidence in a criminal case, a witness, a confession, or physical evidence. And as you heard today, all, th all three of these involve some risk of error. So we just have to... We're not going to be able to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're going to be using all these in the future. But we just have to be aware of that risk of error, the fact that mistakes can occur, and none of these are bulletproof. And to the degree that we understand how they can go wrong, where they go wrong, what are the circumstances that can lead them to going wrong, we'll be better investigators. This is borrowed from uh, the Innocence Project. Um, uh, Peter Newfield showed an updated version. Uh, but we see the same pattern here with uh, um, eyewitness errors followed by improper forensics, then false confessions and lying informants as the major causes of wrongful convictions. However, these are the proximate causes. Underlying these is often faulty thinking. And similar to what we see in an airplane crash, most of these failures have multiple causes. Now, there are many types of thinking errors. The ones that um, I'll be spending most time on today uh, is a rush to judgment, premature decision making, particularly a premature shift from an evidence-based investigation to a suspect-based investigation and then cognitive biases. There's like 50 or 60 identified cognitive biases in the psychology literature, um, but I'm gonna again focus on just a few, and that will be uh, confirmation bias and its cousin tunnel vision. 
Rush to judgment, uh, and I sh should mention that we're currently involved in a National Institute of Justice Sentinel Events project looking at causal factors associated with investigative failures and wrongful convictions. And we see the, the data still being analyzed, but we see rush to judgment as a very common factor in many of the cases. It's caused by pressure to solve a horrible and high profile cr or high profile crime, one with child victims or maybe uh, uh, multiple murders or something that gathers a lot of media attention. These pressures can be both internal to the police organization, um, a detective's desire to, to catch a horrible criminal and, and protect the public. It could be organizational pressures from on high. It could be external pressures from politicians, from the media, from the community. A rush to judgment can be compounded by a number of factors, of which some of the worst are intuition. Um, police sometimes refer to their gut instinct, but it's not instinct, it's intuition, and it's got nothing to do with their stomach. And it's one of two types of decision-making processes humans have. The other one is analytic judgment. And analytic judgment, unfortunately, is a lot of work. And people put a lot of faith in their intuition. This is fine, but there's serious limitations to intuition, which are often not understood. I once had a detective say to me that my gut never lies, meaning his gut instinct never lies. Well, that's just simply not true. We have intuition for a simple reason. We have it for survival. So if something to a police officer doesn't feel right on the street, you know, maybe they'll step behind some cover, call for some backup. That promotes their survival. A good analogy is a smoke alarm. If a smoke alarm went off, we'd all leave the building, even though we know that 99% of the time the smoke alarm is false. So intuition exists for survival. It does not exist to be an accurate measure of what's going on. Now, to the degree that sometimes it allows us to get from A to Z very quickly, the intuition can be helpful. But research has shown, and I think this is research by Kahneman and, and Tversky to uh, follow up from Richard, um, has shown that there's two requirements for your intuition to be accurate. One is experience. Now, even if we have a very experienced homicide detective, that individual may have very little experience investigating a child sex murder, for example. And the other one is consistency in the playing field. So never believe in anyone's intuition about what stock to buy, because that's a very inconsistent playing field. Another is wrong assumptions, and the third is probability errors. And I was uh, glad to see some discussion of probability earlier, because it's often ignored as a factor leading into wrongful convictions. Intuition is, unlike the analytic aspects, it's fast and it's powerful, automatic and effortless. But it takes us a long time to learn what we need to to apply intuition correctly. It's also implicit, meaning it's below the level of consciousness, and it's affected by our emotions. Consequently, it's difficult to control or modify. And this leads to the fact that it's often error prone. So yes, intuition should be paid attention to, but not to the point where it starts to contradict the available evidence. Whenever we go into a problem, whether it's an investigation or something we want to solve, we usually have a number of assumptions. And as new evidence is accumulated, we need to reevaluate our assumptions and abandon them if necessary. However, tunnel vision may prevent that from happening. And given enough time, assumptions can actually morph into facts, especially in a large investigation involving changes of personnel. I have a picture up there of the white box truck uh, that police are stopping in uh, Maryland following the DC sniper case. So there was a white box truck seen near a scene, um, near one of the shooting scenes at the very beginning. It somehow uh, changed into a white van later on during the investigation. Um, I'm not quite sure how a box truck becomes a van. No one bothered to stop and think about how common these vehicles, white vans, white box trucks are. You stand in an intersection in Washington, D.C., and five, within five minutes, three of them will drive by. So um, that was an assumption that was given way too much weight and ended up being incorrect and hurt the investigation. Uh, we encourage investigators to write all their assumptions down and post them on the wall of the investigative room so they don't forget what are assumptions. Now, I'll let Mr. Morton speak about this case. I had um, no involvement with it. Uh, but one of the things that I find 
fascinating about his case is he was convicted on the basis of virtually no evidence and I think maybe a few assumptions and maybe someone's quote unquote gut instinct. Um, and of course it's you know, a classic case where the real killer was allowed to go free and to kill again. You saw Richard, I don't think he spoke about it, but you saw Richard Leo's slide that had a Monopoly get out of jail free card. So it's always important to remember that a wrongful conviction is a license to continue offending for the real killer or rapist. Let's talk about probability errors. Now, often people say, what does probability have to do with solving a crime? Well, a lot. These are all probability statements that you might see in a, a report from a detective or from a lab or from a profiler or from a judge. So statements like possible, likely, certain, risky, common, balance of probabilities, reasonable probable grounds, beyond a reasonable doubt. These are all statements of probability. And therefore, we need to regard them as mathematical probability. Now, the courts have been very reluctant to take Bayesian probability and other more formal articulations, but we can go pretty far by just remembering that they're probabilities and thinking of them as something that is, has a certain level of uncertainty. It's a very good example from David Milgard's case. Um, David Milgard's case involved the murder of a nurse whose body was found in the snow. Um, it was a case uh, back in 1993 that uh, Neil Boyd got a grant we ended up doing an independent study on. And I, I said to David Milgard today that uh, the last time I saw you, you were in Stony Mountain Prison. So it was, of course, nice to see how that ended up for him. Um, there are a number of issues and problems with this case. Like I mentioned, there's often multiple factors. but. Here's an interesting um, example of an error in probability, and it occurred during the trial in testimony given by the pathologist. And I should mention this was a sexual assault. The victim's body was found lying in the snow. The police did a great effort sifting through the snow, trying to find any seminal fluid. Um, of course, there was a ton of seminal fluid all over the nurse's uniform, but it was white, and they didn't see it, and they didn't bother testing it. And if that happened, David. Milgard wouldn't be here today because um, it would have led them in the right direction. In any event, they find a tiny bit of semen in the snow. They test it. Remember, this is before DNA. This is back in like 1969. They test it and they find the presence of type A antigens. And serology was really big before DNA. So we've got type A antigens. We can exclude people. Unfortunately for David Milgard, he's got type A blood the same as the real killer did. Um, but there was a problem. They tested Milgard and found him to be an anti-secretor. By that I mean the majority of the population, about 80% in North America, are secretors. It means you can look at their other bodily fluids, semen, saliva, urine, and you can determine what blood type they have. These people are called secretors. David Milgard was tested as a non-secretor. And this should have been enough to exonerate him, but to get around this little problem, they came up with the idea that, look, if some of David Milgard's blood got into his semen, then they would be picking up on those antigens, and that would explain this. So, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Emson is on the stand, and okay, we've got a doctor here. He's um, worked at the University of Saskatchewan. He's uh, you know, an expert. And the prosecutor says, are there conditions under which human blood can get into the seminal fluid in the male person versus the seminal fluid in the female person? Um, yes. Could you tell the court what they are, please? One would be local injury to the male genitals. A second and quite common occurrence would be any inflammation, either internal or external, of the male genitals. Now, I've bolded quite common because quite common is a statement of probability. So what does this mean? Well, Let's, let's look at something we might be a little more familiar with. And I would ask you, how likely is it a detective has ever investigated a burglary? Well, probably 99%, especially in Vancouver. How likely is it a person has ever been burglared in their lifetime? Uh, again, depending on where you live, let's say 20%. How likely is it that a given house will be broken into today? So when I say how common, when I ask you how common burglary is, it really depends on the perspective and the person. Maybe this particular ailment that Dr. Emerson tested to is being quite common, 
means that during his medical career, he has seen it or talked to a colleague that has seen it. But the relevant probability is actually the last one here. How likely is it that David Milgard was suffering from this affliction on that given day? And the answer is extremely unlikely. But unfortunately, you have this quite common um, testimony from the expert, and that was a, a big problem for the case. Now, tunnel vision isn't really identified in the psychology literature. It's sort of a common sense uh, understanding. Uh, it's been defined, I think some of this might be from the Sofano inquiry, one of the inquiries that uh, Peter mentioned earlier that we had in Canada following a wrongful conviction. Um, it results from a narrow focus on a limited range of alternatives. It will occur or can occur if police prematurely shift to a suspect-based investigation from an evidence-based investigation. Some of the negatives is it can undermine rigorous evidence testing and cause systemic failure. Confirmation bias is defined in the psychology literature, and there are is a type of uh, selective thinking, and there's three different forms of it: a bias search for evidence, a bias interpretation of the evidence you've collected, and then bias memory or selective recall. The first two are very can be very problematic in a criminal investigation that suffers from tunnel vision. Um, some of those problems is you just take the evidence that supports your theory at face value, you ignore or attack contradicting evidence, and you do not consider alternative theories. And confirmation bias is a really big problem in wrongful convictions, but also in cases that went in the wrong direction, ended up not arresting anybody, but could have been solved otherwise. Now, there are signs for tests, or te what, tests for confirmation bias. You know, you, first of all, you look for evidence that was missed post-judgment or post-decision. Was that evidence treated in a biased fashion? And one of the simplest things to do is you do a little mental experiment. And you look at the order in which the evidence was collected, the decision made to arrest somebody, and then you just shuffle that evidence around. And if you think about it, your decision should not depend on that order. But often it will. And you say, well, look, if they had found that piece of clothing earlier on in the case, this thing would have gone in a completely different direction. Now, there's a number of police officers, some I know in this audience today, and I'm sure you've all been subjected to the wild and convoluted theories of defense attorneys trying to explain things to get their clients off. Let me just give you an interesting example. Uh, it was a murder case, sexual murder case of two young girls. Their bodies were found in a remote wooded area. From one of the victims, and these girls were like seven or eight years of age, from one of the, the victims, sperm with DNA was recovered from uh, her vagina, her mouth, and her anus. An analysis of the DNA from that sperm matched, it, matched a convicted violent serial rapist who was a friend of her brother. Now, the defense claimed that the sperm was unrelated and suggested what happened was the friend was over visiting her brother. He was on the uh, bed that she slept in and he masturbated there. And then she later came along, got into that same bed, maybe to watch a movie, and then touched it and somehow transferred it to her mouth, her anus, and her vagina. Now, most police officers, when they hear this, are going to probably roll their eyes at this incredibly uh, unrealistic explanation, and rightfully so. However, while this is a true story, it happened in Illinois, there's one thing I've changed, and that this wasn't the defense claiming this. It was the district attorney. And what happened is he had already convicted somebody, then DNA exonerated that person, pointed towards the real offender, but the district attorney was unwilling to change his mind. And he came up with this incredibly insane explanation to determine the, um, to explain the existence of this DNA. And I use this as an example to indicate the power of confirmation bias and how sometimes all log logic goes out the window once someone has made their mind up, especially if they have sunk costs involved. In other words, they've arrested or prosecuted somebody, their reputation's tied up in it, et cetera. So never underestimate the power of confirmation bias. Police departments 
are unique organizations in many ways, and they have their strong cultures, and that's both good and bad. Um, some of the organizational pressures um, and factors that can lead to mistaken um, investigations and wrong decisions um, are groupthink, um, which was identified by Yale psychologist Irvin Janning following the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion um, back in the early 60s. And afterwards, President Kennedy said, how could we make such a stupid mistake? And um, he came up with, Janice came up with the idea of groupthink. And it's defined as the reluctance to think critically and challenge the dominant theory. Um, it's sort of like no one wants to tell the emperor that he has no clothes. This occurs in highly cohesive groups under pressure to make important decisions. And of course, this in, um, certainly involves investigative teams um, that are trying to catch an offender of a, a serious crime. Another organizational issue is sunk costs, which I've already mentioned. You've arrested somebody, you've said something to the media, you've put all your money following a particular investigative path. It's very difficult to turn those battleships around and start to pursue a different tact. And tied into this are problems of personal ego and organizational reputation. Sometimes our best, let me rephrase it, some of our most famous law enforcement organizations are the most reluctant to admit when they've made a mistake because they're very aware of their reputations. So these are all organizational problems that play into the problems of tunnel vision and confirmation bias and ultimately uh, errors in thinking. I want to uh, just illustrate some of this with um, a case that I did have involvement with, the David Cam triple murder case. David Cam was a um, former Indiana former Indiana State Trooper, and um, he came home one night after playing basketball with 10 other people and found his wife and two children shot, murdered um, in the uh, Bronco that his wife drove that was found in the car, um, car garage of his house. He phoned the police, of course, they came by. One of the problems was, um, here's just a quick summary of, of the case. Um, one of the problems was a blood spatter expert determined that Milgard had, I'm sorry, that uh, uh, David Cam had been exposed to high velocity impact spatter, meaning that he was probably there when the shots were fired. And there's actually a great um, clip that you can see on uh, YouTube where um, the police, you know, uh, they filmed the interrogation, and they're confronting him with this, and he's denying it, and one of the detectives says, look it, uh, this guy didn't start yesterday, these are experts. But the guy actually, the, the so-called expert, had literally started yesterday. <laughs> and he had never been trained, he claimed to have a, working on a PhD in fluid dynamics, which was a lie, he perjured himself actually on the stand, he had never been to a case before. The blood spatter expert that sent him, who had some history, ultimately ended up making over half a million dollars U.S. working on this case. Now, here's a good example of sunk costs and um, a rush to judgment. Because is he going to admit that he sent an uh, untrained novice to the scene of a triple murder um, and got it wrong? Um, one of the others issues is underneath the son's body was a sweatshirt, a prison sweatshirt that had a nickname written on the back of it. Um, and even though DNA was recovered from the sweatshirt, it wasn't submitted to CODIS. I mean, what's the need? We got the right guy. There's no need to really, you know, this is an artifact. That's actually what someone said. Oh, this is just an artifact. I have no idea. I was a police officer for 21 years. I never heard that term, artifact. There's the sweatshirt. There were and it's one of the things Peter didn't talk about today, but I'm sure he could have, about problems with, with blood spatter. It's one of those things that's part science, but also part art. And the issue becomes when experts refuse to admit that there's an error rate. Even DNA has an error rate. Okay, so so does fingerprinting, so does tool marks, so does blood spatter. And blood spatter has a lot of error rate. So there's the seven drops. Um, most of the time when you have high velocity impact spatter, the um, diameter of the blood drops is less than a millimeter and there's hundreds if not thousands of them. Um, in this case, there's only seven, which probably came from his daughter's hair when he leaned across her to pull his son out of the vehicle. Here's the sweatshirt that was not submitted to CODIS. Um, and when it was, 
Oh, let me, hold on, I'll get to a second. I just want to show you this um, in terms of rush to judgment. This is a list of the major evidence recovered in the case. So we have the murders at the top that's highlighted. Then we have autopsies. After the autopsies, David Cam becomes a suspect. We have the blood stain pattern analysis. Then Cam is arrested. All the other items under that is very important evidence, including setting the time of the murders, that they just had wrong. If you look at their probable cause affidavit, um, something like uh, nine out of 11 items on that list were just wrong, but they made their mind up and they never bothered doing the CODIS follow-up and they didn't identify Charles Bonnet, who was a convicted violent felon with a foot fetish. Um, and uh, when they interviewed him, it would be interesting to get to uh, Richard's thoughts on that interview, because they don't interview him as a suspect. They interview him as, can you explain this DNA? Because you're really upsetting our current theory of the crime. And then when they got, they found his palm print on the vehicle, they knew he was there. So they were like going, you know, you could be facing the death penalty, tell you what David Kim made you do. So it was really, really horrible um, interrogation as well. Um, anyways, Kim was uh, eventually found not guilty and is currently suing the county. Now, I'm sure that many of you have heard of or played the game Clue as children. Now, what is a clue? A clue is a piece of evidence. However, what you really do in this game is you throw a random die, you go somewhere, you grab a person, Mr. Uh, um, White, Mrs. White, I mean, um, a piece of uh, like a rope or some other uh, uh, murder weapon, and you make an accusation. So if you really think about Clue, it's kind of like a bunch of wrongful convictions and almost like virtually no evidence. So you are just randomly guessing things. And unfortunately, there is often a lack of attention to clues and evidence and what they mean in a case. And especially when you start to have a problem with a premature shift from an evidence-based to a suspect-based investigation, then you're no longer looking for evidence. You are no longer thinking about the evidence. Instead, you're just trying to put a case together and get a conviction. People that have worked in the early days of radar um, or signals processing developed evidence theory and information theory of what we can learn a little bit from. Now, we can't establish hard numbers um, like they can in physics or engineering, but we can at least think about some of these things. And um, you've heard a bit of this already in the, in the uh, uh, morning sessions. So in the real world, our information is perfect, imperfect, almost always imperfect, especially in a criminal investigation. It's imprecise, it's ambiguous, it's uncertain. So how do we reason from imperfect information? How do we combine different pieces of information into some whole? So there are, like I say, mathematical models, belief functions that can be used. But what I want to focus on is, is what they call value and confidence, but what psychologists call significance and reliability. So any piece of evidence that we have in a crime is going to have both elements, significance and reliability. Significance, or the strength or the power of the evidence, is how important the evidence is for solving the crime. Reliability or weight is the accuracy or the truthfulness of the evidence. Research has shown that people place more importance on significant evidence, even if its reliability is low. And that's a problem. Um, at the risk of becoming a little too mathematical, let me just show you what we want to have ideally whenever we have a test. And this can be a forensic test. Uh, this can be a, a test done in your doctor's office. It can be any number of different things. So if we look at this little chart, it's called a confusion matrix. At the top, we have people who are guilty and we have people who are innocent. Then we have a test of a type of evidence and then we have, a, let's say, a negative result from that same um, evidence. Maybe it's a test for gunshot residue. So in these four quarters, we've uh, got the probability of evidence given the um, guilt, probability evidence given innocence. So this is the true positive and the false positive rates. And if you have a test and no one can talk about the false positive rate, then you don't know how often it's going wrong. Then we also have uh, the probability of no evidence given guilt, probability of no evidence given innocence. This is a 
a picture of what that looks like. And what we want is a very high probability of evidence given guilt and a very low probability of the evidence given innocence. And we can actually calculate the ratio of that. And, and um, Richard did this with some of his stuff on uh, different methods of doing um, interviewing. But whether it's a doctor doing a mammogram test or um, a uh, forensic analysis in the lab, this is the same thing that we want. Now, I'm a Bayesianist, and you've already heard someone mention Bayesian probability today. So let's, I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but there's one thing I do want to go into, and that's the likelihood ratio. The likelihood ratio is the probability of the evidence given guilt divided by the probability of the evidence given innocence. So if I back up, that's this area, or sorry, that, that, um, sorry, that length there divided by that width there. Oh, sorry, sorry, let me back up. That length there divided by that length there. The higher the ratio, the better the test is. Okay? So probably evidence given guilt divided by probably evidence given innocence. The higher that ratio is, the more powerful the evidence is. But let's look at this for a second. And the likelihood ratio establishes the significance of the evidence. So here... If you think about it, the numerator, these are probabilities, so they range between 0 and 1. So the top part, you know, uh, uh, very low probability evidence given guilt is going to be 0, very high will be 1. So if you think about it, all the numerator can do is exonerate somebody. The denominator is what determines someone's guilt, because it's 1 over this range of 1 to 0, so it means it's actually a range between 1 and infinity. So if we think of DNA, the probability of someone matching a uh, uh, full house DNA set is going to be in the millions or tens of millions to one. So it's not infinity, but it's incredibly, incredibly um, small, and therefore it's a very powerful indicator. On the other hand, if I think sort of the typical description I would get of a suspect in a robbery when I worked Vancouver Skid Road, um, white male wearing uh, brown hair, uh, mid-20s wearing jeans and a dark jacket, you know, it wasn't very good at help us focusing on the individual. So the problem is many investigators only look for the first part. How closely does this suspect match the crime? And they don't think, and, and I think you've already heard this, they don't think about how rare this indicator is. So having brown hair isn't particularly powerful. Having a tattoo of a kangaroo in Canada is, would be very rare. So we need to think about both aspects of these. And we need to think much more about the probability of this evidence given innocence. And that number be very, better be very small, otherwise your evidence does not have much significance. Um, here's a classic example. You've, you've heard the term diagnosticity already from Richard. Um, and you can calculate diagnosticity a number of different ways, but primarily it's based on your likelihood ratios. So you want a high number. And the ability of a good test, um, a good test, sorry, is going to have diagnosticity, which will allow you to determine which particular suspect or which particular theory of a crime is going to be the most likely. In the wrongful conviction of Guy Paul Moran, who was arrested for the murder of his neighbor, a nine-year-old Christine Jessup, um, the fact that he didn't attend Christine Jessup's funeral was argued at his trial by the prosecutor as evidence of consciousness of guilt. Well, the rebuttal to this was the police were actually at her funeral videotaping everyone there because they believed that the offender, there was a possibility the offender would come to the trial. So the defense is saying, and this resonated during the commission of inquiry into his wrongful conviction, the defense was saying, look it, if he doesn't go to the trial, you think that's evidence of consciousness of guilt. If he, does go, uh, he, if he does, doesn't go to the funeral, evidence of consciousness of guilt. If he does go to the funeral, well, you have him on video and he becomes you know, a better suspect. You cannot have it both ways. So here's a good example of evidence that has no value, no diagnosticity. In other words, this likelihood ratio would be one. It wouldn't change anything. Now, I mentioned I said evidence is both significance and reliability, and we place too much weight on significance. 
we can take our prior probability, you know, however likely somebody is until we get a piece of evidence, and we can say, all right, with the new evidence, we have an increase in that probability of their guilt. Okay? Good. But if we fail to think about the reliability of the evidence, we'll make a mistake. So here's a reliability factor, about two-thirds. You can see that it significantly drops the posterior probability. So we need to always ask ourselves, is this evidence, no matter how juicy it is, and no matter how much it plays into our theory or our narrative, is it accurate? Is it reliable? Is it the truth? Um, I'll give you two examples, and, um, and I think I'll be wrapping up. One is the infamous case of latent fingerprint number 17, that was recovered following the Madrid 11M bombings. Uh, a number of explosives were set on a commuter train one morning in Madrid, Spain, went off um, killing and maiming almost 200 people. These acts were committed by a Al-Qaeda-inspired Moroccan terrorist group. The Spanish police found a bag containing um, elements that were used in the uh, um, explosives, and they recovered a latent fingerprint, which you see on the left, from the bag. They submitted this to Interpol, and of course the um, fingerprint was checked around the world, including by the FBI. The FBI compared it to an immigration database, and lo and behold, it matched in their determination a man by the name of Brandon Mayfield, who was a lawyer in Oregon and a Muslim. So they follow him for a while, eventually arrest him. Um, the examiner who did this was actually a very good examiner. Um, and his superior checked it over, and other people checked over and said, this is a match. Now, there are, there are more than one thing that went, went wrong in this analysis, but what I want to point out to you is you don't have to be a fingerprint expert to look at that latent print and see it's very poor quality. And that introduces a reliability problem. Another factor was there's some circular reasoning. What you're supposed to do is identify characteristics in the latent and see if those characteristics are in the known. But often fingerprint experts take a shortcut and they look at the better quality known and then see if they, see if they can find them, find in quotation marks, in the latent print. And that's where subjectivity can play a big role. Brandon Mayfield was innocent. Uh, DNA matched um, the uh, fingerprints um, to another individual, um, a Moroccan, and um, I think Mayfeld got several million dollars from the federal government. But here's a good example of the failure to consider the reliability of the evidence, even though it was highly significant. Another one was David Milgard's case. Um, here's nursing aide Gail Miller, who was found murdered in the snow in an alley, um, 1969. Uh, this is, I say, the, the case that Neil and I worked on when I first met David Milgard. Um, and remember I said they had to look in the snow and they found a little bit of sperm. Now, Milgard was not from Saskatoon. He was a teenager, drove up with a couple of friends. Um, they were on a drug buying ex, um, uh, expedition. Um, and the police became suspicious of them. And I don't want to go into all the details, but one of the things they did was, here's a summary of the case. One of the things they did is that they began talking to these teenagers. And at one point, they arrest Nicole John, hold her overnight, then they interview her the next morning, okay? So, and this goes on, this sort of interest and questioning goes on for a number of months. But after a night in jail, Nicole John gives a statement of which, this is a summary, um, and um, I think, I'm oh, sorry, this is just more of the case. So I'm gonna show you a summary of the statement she gave the police. She said that she saw she and Mil Milgard were in the car. Ron Wilson had left because they got stuck. He was going to find some help. And then Milgard got out of the car and stabbed the woman. I recall seeing David in the alley on the north side of the car. He had a hold of the same girl we spoke to a minute before. I saw him grab her purse. Dave reached into his pocket and pulled out the knife. The knife was in his right hand. I don't know if Dave had a hold of this girl or not at this time. All I recall seeing is him stabbing her with the knife. The next I recall is him taking her around the corner of the alley. I think I ran after that. Now, what is the significance of this evidence? It's highly significant. She said, I'm an eyewitness to the murder, and David Milgard did it. What is the reliability of this evidence? All right, you've got a teenager who's been held in jail overnight, um, repeated questioning by the police. 
More so was the problem is that they said they encountered this girl walking down the street. Um, the temperature of this day was 30 below, I think colder with wind chill. Um, she lived a block from the bus stop. One of the things Neil and I did was time it out, and that's a three minute walk. So the timing doesn't make any sense. She was at the bus stop and would have been on the bus, and I think halfway to work by the time this would have happened. Another issue is there was no blood in the snow where this was supposedly happened. Another problem is this wasn't even on a route to work. And having grown up in Saskatoon as a kid, it's 30 below, you don't walk any further than you have to, I'll tell you. And probably the, one of the more compelling um, aspects was Gail Miller had a set of stab wounds in her coat, her winter coat. She had a set of stab wounds in her back, and those patterns matched. She had no stab wounds in her nursing uniform. So the man, at some point, her coat came down, the uniform came down, the coat went back on again. None of which is described as part of this blitz attack on the police. Nicole John, when later interviewed, says she couldn't remember it, she refused to testify, um, but it got introduced at trial. So, highly significant, but incredibly low reliability, and ultimately led to a wrongful conviction. So, generally for police officers and investigators, it's important to think about all the evidence, evaluate the probability of all evidence for every viable theory and suspect, Remember that probability of evidence given innocence determines guilt. Probability of evidence given um, guilt exonerates. Low reliability will reduce high significance. And you should assess the evidence diagnosticity. In conclusion, a quote from John Maynard Keynes where he says, I change my information when I alter my conclusions. What do you do, sir? Well, most people prefer to believe what they prefer to be true, as Francis Bacon said. Thank you very much. Right on time. Questions? I have a question. Just on your last slide, when you were comparing the significance of the evidence to reliability, to come up with a Bayesian, as a Bayesian equation? Um, I was comparing the uh, likelihood ratio to the significance, and then the reliability is a separate I the, factor. I the likelihood ratio was based on the significance and the reliability. No, just the significance. The signi but, yeah. you can, but using the example of the Milgard case, you, how would you put a number on the significance of that? Well, I don't think you can, and the courts won't accept them if you do. So but if, what you can do is yeah. say, that was highly significant evidence, and which is what they did do. But what they don't do is, well, how reliable was that evidence? And, you know, it's helpful to know what the formulas are, but you're not going to work out the numbers. What you do need to do is, yeah, maybe it's exactly what we think happened or it fits our theory, but it's so low in terms of its reliability, we have to be very, very careful to but, put any weight on this. But before, when Richard Leo was talking about significance, he was putting it in the context of base rates, right? And you don't have any base rates for even for assessing its significance, do you? Well, your base rate would turn your pri priori. It doesn't turn your, um, then you have your likelihood ratio, and your likelihood ratio is just determined by those two factors, then you've got your posterior. So your base rate is going to determine that priori. That's why the courts often don't accept um, mathematical analysis of this sort, because they don't know the base rates on something. There are no base rates for any of those things. Yeah, but that, that doesn't affect any of this. It affects how you think about the value of the evidence, how much, um, how much the reliability can dilute the significance. And if you have, even if you have very powerful, significant evidence, if its, if it's reliability is low, then it doesn't mean anything. And if you want to actually incorporate reliability into Bayesian, there's um, uh, like the Dempster-Schafer formula in uh, um, evidence theory that can be used. Um, but again, virtually never do we have the numbers to do it. So I think the best way to think about this is as a thinking tool and not let yourself get overthrown by something that is so powerful but is likely to be wrong. And unfortunately, the research shows that most people are overwhelmed by how powerful the evidence is. But, but even, even when you're thinking about the reliability, the, the problem I have is that it's sort of like um, the concept of parallel universes. If somebody looked at the reliability of her testimony when Mr. Milgard was initially on trial, my guess is they would have a very different assessment of its reliability 
than the one you offered today, knowing that he was in fact innocent. And one of the things that we've seen time and time again is that, um, for instance, this morning when, when Gary Wells was here, somebody says, well, you're aware in the Bloodsworth case, well, you're aware that in some cases there might be three eyewitnesses. So when you think the person's guilty, okay, at the time that the jury is deliberating or on direct appeal, you think that evidence is incredibly reliable that convicted him because you have three separate eyewitness identifications. Fast forward 20 years, you have a DNA exoneration. You now go, you now go back and you critically evaluate those same three identifications. Your own bias, affected by the fact that you know there's been a DNA exoneration, is going to give you a much lower reliability assessment of that evidence than you had previously. No, I, I believe you can, you, you can um, evaluate the reliability of evidence at the time. And in this case, she described the attack occurring at a place where there's no blood, which was not on the route the victim took, the fact that there were no stab wounds in her uniform, there were, and she was held overnight as a juvenile and then questioned by the police. So that, those to me are all huge flags, and you don't need a DNA analysis to say there's something wrong with her story. I feel like I should be your defense lawyer, you two, because uh, one of the important things to remember is that when Neil and Kim did their analysis, Milgard had not been exonerated. Uh, the DNA evidence was not available, and they provided analysis pre-acquittal, pre-exoneration, saying she was an unreliable witness, and all the other evidence was unreliable. It's so, a matter of fact. And as a police officer at the time, I wasn't exactly like pro getting people out of prison for sex murder, so... Uh, I, if I had a bias, it was the other direction. Other questions? Um, juries are actually encouraged not to look at evidence uh, piecemeal, which is sort of the opposite of what you're suggesting. Um, and in fact, the um, legal instruction ironically comes from Guy Paul Moran's case that the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt doesn't apply to individual pieces of evidence. So what our jury system and fact-finding system encourages is that you can compound unreliable pieces of evidence to become proof beyond a reasonable doubt. When logically, if two pieces of evidence are not related, so let's say two pieces of forensic evidence aren't related, the fact that one piece is unreliable shouldn't be made more reliable by the fact that another piece is reliable. But that is what juries are encouraged uh, to do. Um, and it's antithetical to what you're suggesting. And of course, it doesn't make any sense that some conclusion that is scientifically unreliable becomes reliable because another piece of evidence is reliable. Yeah, very, very good. I mean, I do understand you want to look at the evidence entirely, but to put the pieces of the evidence together, which is something the Bayes' theorem allows you to do if you have the numbers, you can at least be thinking about what those pieces of evidence mean. To go back to the Cam case, he, I mentioned he was playing basketball with 10 alibi witnesses, and um, that kind of got ignored. Um, you could always make an argument that somehow he slipped out for half an hour and no one saw him. But one of the interesting things is, during the current de set of depositions for the civil case, uh, the, uh, one of Cam's lawyers said to one of the detectives, if there was no high-velocity impact spatter on his T-shirt, would you still think he's guilty? He says, yes, I would. But there was no other evidence at all. So he has made up his mind, and nothing is going to make him change it. And, um, you know, the, the very tragic case of, of Michael Morton, who... I mean, overwhelming evidence, first of all, no evidence for his guilt in the first place, in my mind. He had DNA pointing to the right offender, who was a killer, um, and, and committed another murder after the fact. I mean, there, there's just virtually nothing to be unsure about, but he had to deal with family and other repercussions of people that still thought that he was guilty somehow. It's, you know, there's a classic saying, once the bell is rung, you can't unring it. And humans are not very good at reassessing their thoughts and opinions. So one of the most, you know, juries are instructed not to make up their mind until they, they hear all the evidence. But they need to be, I think, very analytical about what they're hearing, what it means, and then how do all the pieces fit together in an overall pattern. But even before the juries, 
Prosecutors and DAs need to do that. And even before that, detectives need to do that. That's why a rush to judgment is so pernicious. Because you've made your mind up before you have all the evidence that you should be considering. You now have sunk costs. It's a lot harder to walk backwards. And it becomes very difficult in those cases, um, even when the evidence makes it kind of clear what's going on, for, for them to back away. And if you get a horrible case, you know, especially in a law enforcement oriented jurisdiction, which is Williamson County was, well, you know, better be safe than sorry. Let's just lock them up. And, you know, of course, then that leads to these mistakes, tragedies, and errors. Professor Russo? Yes. Uh, yeah, you were one of the people in the room who's a cross border expert on this subject. You, you, you know the systems on both sides. You referred to the commissions of inquiry, which are a Canadian uh, institution, let's call it. Uh, are there other features of the justice system and, and the differences between the two countries that allow, would allow us to look at wrongful conviction in, in a comparative way, i.e. what happens in the States and what happens in, has happened in Canada? Um, there are a lot of things that happen in the United States that I think are quite problematic. I don't think electing district attorneys is a good idea. It introduces a, a popularity, political aspect into you know, the justice system. Uh, electing judges, same thing. I, I don't think that's the best way to go about it. Um, I've not seen this. I know there are people that do this type of international research. I think Ron Huff is one of them, but I'm, I'm just not quite sure what the comparative rates are. Um, but I think you also heard from Peter earlier that there's a, a very big problem with wrongful convictions of people arrested for misdemeanors, and then they just plead guilty so, because they're being held in, uh, under bail conditions, um, sorry, with no bail conditions, and they may spend months in, in jail. So they say, screw it, I'll just pay the fine, even though I'm innocent, and I'll get out of here. So that's a very problematic uh, systemic issue. And I, th I think Peter's going to also... Just, I'm, I'm, not as, I'm not as sure as this, and somebody here will correct me probably, but um, although I still think that the base rate issue is a big problem in what you were saying before with whether it's a false confession or any other piece of evidence and the way it's construed like these. The I think you have an apples and oranges thing. Like, we could talk about like it later. The gentleman in the audience who was talking about how an unreliable piece of evidence all of a sudden becomes reliable when it's in conjunction with a more reliable piece of evidence. but. In response to that, um, I think that in our system, for instance, we have a much greater opportunity for post-conviction adjudications in a court of law than you do. Uh, Mr. Milgard was talking about the reality of the fact that he cannot travel to the United States because the conviction still shows up because it was eventually, he said, handled by the executive branch um, as opposed to uh, the courts that initially adjudicated him, whereas uh, I think Mr. Morton will tell you that uh, he's probably been around the world a fair amount uh, in the last couple of years, a little bit, and, uh, and that's because that adjudication is completely expunged and has full faith and effect in international immigration matters and other contexts. So, you know, we have, we, we have more opportunities to go back into court, I think, than you do. Any other questions? Thanks for that information. I found it really interesting. I'm, and it, I was wondering, as I was listening to you, about some practical ways of avoiding biased thinking. Um, I'm very aware of the fact that it's very, very difficult to seriously consider alternative hypotheses um, when you believe you have sufficient evidence to support one. Um, and I don't want to steal this story, but at lunch I had a brief conversation with a detective from Abbotsford who I thought had a great solution. And I, I'll tell his story if he's not comfortable telling it himself. Okay, so what, what he suggested to me is that in, in some of the serious um, investigations that occur uh, with his department in Abbotsford, that they assign a detective to be an advocate um, opposing the theory. So that person is responsible really for raising challenges 
Um, and, and if there isn't a challenge to be raised, that person has nothing to say. What do you think about that as a general proposition for investigations and the signed advocate? I think it's a great idea, mm -hmm. and you might hear Doug Lepar talk about some of the initiatives he introduced in the Vancouver Police Department following the missing women case, the, the devil's advocate. I'll also mention that in the United Kingdom, after certain periods of time, um, I think one is a month and the other one is a year, an unsolved murder case gets sent to a senior investigating officer from a completely different jurisdiction. So not your drinking buddy, not your friend, somebody that's looking to make their career on your mistakes. And that produces two things. One, the original detective makes sure that everything is considered to the best that he or she can. Second, you get a fresh set of eyes. Because just like peer review in science, it's impossible for us, as you said, to totally ignore our biases and we make um, all sorts of uh, things that we're not even aware of. You know, it's like proofreading your own paper. You can't do that. Um, and so this idea of external review is a powerful one, but I think has so far been pretty much rejected by most police agencies. Um, I'm the chair of the Austin Public Safety Commission, and we make recommendations to city council and the police department on issues. And when I, I mentioned this, it went over like a lead balloon. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it could be a no-cost item because it could be reciprocal agreements and you would have more cases getting solved. But no, it, it's very parochial in the United States. And you know, we have many more police agencies per capita um, than in Canada, and Canada has more per capita than um, England does. So um, I, I think that still we have a long ways to go. Yeah. Questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.